Yeah, we got the projector going. Up there. Function F5. Okay. And what is going on here? Oh. This has got me in some kind of fucking mode here. That it's uh display settings. Okay. Alright, that's the mode that should be up there. So you shouldn't be seeing my hints on what's going to happen to that picture. Alright. Um, as I discovered yesterday, they finally got the e wording up for this course back there. So as a result, I will be posting this video from this lecture later on today back there. Along with I, I gave you the book yesterday or last Thursday. You gave me the thumb drive back, so did everyone get a copy of that? I will also probably be putting the other reference book online later on, probably tomorrow, because I left that at home. I didn't bring it with me up there. So I'm going to jump in here. This is kind of the start of the course right here. Last week was kind of a loss up there. And we're going to jump in here. I'm actually using the slides from another class, and I used them for a review for this that class. This is your first time looking at this. We're going to be looking at numbering systems, and then we're going to look at the basic gates today. So we've got quite a few things there, there to talk about. So let me just kind of go through here. Up there. First off, and I don't remember, I don't think I got into this at all last week, because last Thursday, as I recall, we had no air conditioning, so I went very quickly. So let me go through it a little bit slower. All right, we're used to base 10. Base 10 is because we have 10 fingers and 10 toes. That's what our normal numbering system is based on. That's it. Welcome, welcome. Thank you, Tom. That's there. So we're going to be using, so base 10. Computer systems, for the most part, are binary. In other words, they operate on either an on or off. It'd be like you only had one finger, on or off. You know, thumbs down, thumbs up. You've seen the, the movies, the old Roman gladiators that did either this thing at the end to determine whether or not they should kill the warrior or let him live that there. So that's why computers are, are base two. They're either on or off right there. So we have to learn how to work with different numbering systems. Fortunately, we don't use base two very often, but we use base 16 is what we use more often than that. And there's a reason we'll, we'll work ourselves up to base two. That's there. I don't spend a lot of time on this section I know that the person who taught this last session, when he gave the final exam, he made people do base 2 and base 10 conversions by hand because he didn't allow calculators on, on the final exam. I'm not too worried that you can do this by hand. That there. And the reason I don't worry about doing it by hand is if you're working for me as a digital engineer, I don't want you sitting there at your desk converting base a, a base 10 number to base 2 by hand. I want you to use the calculator. The reason is that you make fewer mistakes, you make, you know, you do it much faster. You know, doing this stuff by hand is very impressive and it looks nice, but it doesn't really serve any purpose. You will be doing it by hand a few times just to see how the process works. But in reality, we don't do it by hand up there. So, when we look at a binary number that there, we only have, if we only have one digit, it's called a bit, right there. And, right there. In the process, and I'm going to skip this slide, and I'm just going to do it by hand on that there. So, if, excuse me, and hopefully, I don't, you know, it looks like I don't mark off too much of that there. Let me jump over here, right here, and let me, This should be bringing up, oh, this thing has got uh, display settings. Let me do keep wide shield. I want to duplicate these, this here. All right, here we go.
Okay, let, let me kind of first off, let me spend a little bit of time going through here, and let's look at a binary number by hand up there, and let's just look at a 4-bit binary number. However, before I do that, let's look at a base 10 number, then we'll up there, so I kind of lied to you. If we look at the number 329, right there, that's equal to th 9 times 1, 2 times 10, or th and 3 times 100, and we add that up, right? Up there. And I, and I probably did this before, but this, this sometimes it helps up there. This happens to be 1 is equal to 10 raised to the 0 power. 10 happens to be 10 raised to the 1 power. 100 happens to be 10 raised to the 2. And that's the way all numbering systems work. Now if we look at a different number, let's look at 3.247 right there. Now we've got decimal places to the right right there. And that is equal to 3 times 1 plus 2 times 1 over 10 plus 4 times 1 over 100 and 7 times 1 over 1,000. We add that up right there. So 1 is equal to 10 to the 0. 1 tenth is equal to 10 to the minus 1. 1 over 100 is equal to 10 to the minus 2. And 1 over 1,000 is equal to 10 to the minus 3. Right there. So that's how base 2 wor or base 10 works. And that holds for any numbering system. So if we want to extend that to base 2, right there, our first digit, so we're going to look at 1011, right there. That's going to be equal to 1 times 2 to the 0, 1 times 2 to the 1, 0 times 2 squared and 1 times 2 to the third right there. So that's a very straightforward right there. And that is going to be equal to 1, 2, 0, 8. So that's going to be 11 is what that number, what that number is. Right there. So that's how a basic numbering system would work, how we would convert that. No, any up there. We could extend this to a 16 bit number. 1101, right there. Again, it's the same thing, only this is going to be 8 bits. You know, 8 bits longer. I did say 16 bit, I meant 8 bit. We won't, we won't work with too many paths up there. So again, we look at this 0 times 2 to the 0, 1 times 2 to the 1. 1 times 2 squared, 1 times 2 cubed, 1 times 2 to the 4th, right there, 0 times 2 to the 5th, 1 times 2 to the 6th, 1 times 2 to the 7th, right there. And that's going to be 0, 1, 4, 8, 16, 0, 64, 128. And you would just add that up right there. I'm not going to go through and add that up. But that's how you would do that there. <coughs> now, if I wanted to be mean on a final exam, and I want to see whether we actually know how a numbering system works, you know, I would pick something your calculator doesn't have right there. So I'm going to say that I'm going to, I'm going to be mean on a final exam. Right there, and I'm going to give you the number 123 base 5. Right there, that's a completely different number. Your calculator won't do that one for you. That's there.
So, but, but, but if you know how a numbering system works, you could do it by hand very easily, right? Right there. So that's going to be equal to 3 times 5 to the 0, 2 times, and that's supposed to be the number 5, which doesn't look for like a 5, my handwriting is bad, 2 times 5 to the 1, 1 times 5 squared. So that's going to be 3, that's going to be 10, because 5 to the 1 is 5, so 2 times that is 10, and 5 squared is 25 times 1, 25, so that's going to give me 38 right there. It's going to be base 10 right there. So that's how a basic numbering system works. If we have a basic numbering system, we can add, multiply, subtract, and divide right there. I'm not going to spend a lot of time doing that, but we can do that with basic numbering systems right there. So if I wanted to go through this here, is let's say that I want to add two numbers in base 5 and, and verify the result of base 10. So I'm going to add, we already have this one here, this is 125. So let's add 123. base 5 to 24 base 5 right there, right? So if, we, if we're going to do this, 123 plus 24 right here. Now 3 plus, seven, three plus 4 is 7, right? But 7 is not a, a number we can use, right? We cannot use 7. We have to subtract 5 and carry it out. So that's going to be 2 with a carry out of 5, right there. You see, that's where, you know, it looks like my newspaper is good now. Okay, so, so that there, 2 plus 2 plus 1 is 5. I can't have a 5, I have to carry a 5 out. So that's a 0 with a carry out. So we, we end up with a result 202, right there. Now. When we, when we look at this right here, and this is base 5, let's verify the results right there. 24 is equal to 4 plus 10, right? And let, let, let me not skip a step right here. Let me, that there, 2 times 1 plus 2 times 5, 5 to the 1, so that's going to be 10 plus 4. 14, right? So 14 in our previous results was 38, right? So 38 plus 14, that's 12. So that's going to give me 52. That's base 10, right? So if this works, 202 should be equal to 52 base 10. So let's convert 202 back to base 10, right here. So 202 base 5 is equal to 2 times 5 to the 0, right? 0 times 5 to the 1, right there. And 2 times 5 squared, right? So this is 2, 0, 50 right there. 52. Right there. And that's what I had here. The two of those agree with each other. So I can add two numbers, base 5, and get a valid answer. And I just checked that. I, I, I added the two numbers using base 5 arithmetic, and <coughs> I added the same two numbers after I converted them to base 10, and I got the same result. You know, and I could spend hours doing subtraction, I could multiply, but at this point I'm going to say, take my word for it, that anything you can do in base 10 you can do in base 5, right there. So, right there. The only rules you have to keep in mind is that, for example, when I add it here, 3 plus 4 is going to be 7. Well, what happens when I add, you know, 7 plus 5, right? That gives me 12. I write down a 2 and carry 10. Here, I write down a 2 and carry a 5. So, so this is... Out there. Now we're going to look at base 2 numbers. 
And when we look at base 2 numbers, right there, we're going to be looking at that there. And I, I'm just going to write a column down of, of numbers. And what I'm going to, the reason I'm writing this column down for numbers is it makes the conversion much faster. So we're going to be more likely doing base two, decimal to base two, and base two to decimal. So we're going to be looking at faster ways of doing it right there. So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm just going to write down these numbers. One, two, four, eight, 16, 32, 64, and 128. Now, one thing you should notice that as we go down this column, I double every, every row. I go 1, 2, 4, I double that. But this is 2 to the 0, 2 to the 1, 2 squared, 2 cubed, 2 to the 4th, 2 to the 5th, 2 to the 6th, 2 to the 7th, right there. So that's, those are those numbers right there. So all we do if we're going to convert a base <coughs> 10 number to base 2 is let's just write the number down and we look on the right and we look for the largest number that we can subtract from it right there. So let's just write down the number 147 right there. So 147, I can subtract from it 128, correct? So let's put a 1 here, 1 here, and what happened here to my 147 disappeared right there, and let's subtract our 128 from that there. Well, that, I need to borrow 3 right there, 17, so it looks like I've got 19 left, right? Well, the largest number that I could put, subtract from 19 is now 16, right? So we put a 1 here, everywhere else we put a 0 here, and we subtract our 16, and we're left with 3. Well, I can't subtract an 8, I can't subtract a 4, I can subtract a 2, 1. So 147 is going to be 1, 0, 0, 1, 0, 0, 1, 1. We just read it off this column, starting from the bottom up. Now, it might be easier for some people to write this column upside down. <laughs> right there, which is perfectly legit if you do it upside down. You know, one of the things you have to realize, and this is sometimes hard for students to catch, is that there's more than one way to solve a problem. So sometimes you have to find which way works best. So. Let me do another example here. So, if we work another example here, here, I'm going to, this time I'm going to write the column upside down here, and I'm going to say 128, 64, 32, 16, 8, 4, 2, 1. This time I'm going to write it upside down because it's easier for some people if you do it upside down, right there. And I'm going to do the number 151, for example. All right, 151, I can subtract 128 from that, correct? So let's subtract 128. 128, I need to borrow a 1. So that gives me a 4. 11, that's a 3. It looks like I've left with 23 left, correct? So we put a 1 here, I'll just put a 1 here, 23, 16 is the next one I can borrow, subtract from, right? So subtract 16, and that leaves me with, uh, it looks like 7, is that correct? Right there, so I put a 1 here, 0, and subtract 4, we're left with 3, I can subtract a 2, right there, 1. So I'm left with the number 1, 0, 0, 1, 0, 1, 1, 1, right there. Right there. That is the, the number that you're left with. So, it's, so the process is pretty much that, that straightforward. I'll give 
I know some of you are explaining to each other what's going on here, so I'll give you a chance to go through that discussion. So. Okay. And you might have seen this in other classes. Have you seen this process before? Right there. So it's, it's a straightforward process. Again, it's not something that's going to make or break your final grade because, as it just so happens, if you've got any calculator, I've got you know, on my phone here, right here, in my calculators, I've got one here called hexadecimal, and I can put in 151, convert, and I get the same answer back. So, you know, there's calculators you can stick on your phone, or, or I think most of the Hewlett Packard calculators have that built, or Texas Instrument calculators have it built. It's not something that you're going to spend a lot of time doing by hand. Right there. So, okay, that's phase two, right there. And right there. So, we use phase two, and there's some slides here. I'll be posting these slides up later later today, hopefully that there. But the, my method of doing it's a little different than the slide. I you know I swipe these slides or the same slides I've used for other classes, and I just do them complete, do it completely different. Right there. So, but this typically goes through how you convert back from, and I'm not going to spend time converting from base two to base ten. Again, it's the same thing. 2 to the 0, 2 to the 1, 2 squared, 2 cubed, 2 to the 4th, right there. And we just add them up, right there. That's the same thing as what I did with the base 5, right there. <coughs> Again, here we go through, and they're skipping the step here, but, you know, if I start with 39, I subtract 32 left, and that's on, I cannot, so I'm left with 7, so I'm down here. I can subtract 2, 4, and 1. Right there. So that's really the same process that I did, except for you skip the steps right here. You skip the steps right here where you had the 32 with a 1, 16 with a 0, 8 with a 0, 4 with a 1, 2 with a 1, 1 with a 1. Right there. You skip that step right there. I'd recommend if you're doing this by hand that you probably don't skip that step unless you've done it many, many times right there. So, okay. Now, we typically, if you notice that I like to group things in groups of four, there's a very logical reason why we group things in groups of four, and that is because what we're ultimately leading to down the road is microprocessors and microcontrollers, not this semester, but next semester, you know, at there, or, or when you go to wherever you're going, you'll be taking a course. At there, usually digital is an introductory course, and then we end up looking at microprocessors. At there, the first microprocessor came out in the late 60s, early 70s. I, some people argue which date, date it is. Intel released a processor under contract called the 4004. Was an eight? It was a four-bit microprocessor. It had four bits. And a microprocessor is a digital device that will read an instruction from memory. It will know what that instruction tells it to do, and it does it. And the instructions are things like move data into one register, add two numbers together, subtract two numbers together, move data from one register to an output port, but to do various things that there. And microprocessors started off being four bits. The 4004 was never sold commercially. It was designed actually under contract for a company that made calculators. It was to run the run a calculator. Intel was run by a gentleman by the name of Gordon Moore, who's still around today. Is that there? Some of you might have heard of Moore's Law. That there, I'll explain what Moore's Law means later. That there, but, <coughs> but uh, basically. That there, it's a small. It was a small company in Silicon Valley. It's now a much larger company. They have a very large plant in Penang, right there. They make. They're probably the world's number one manufacturer of microprocessors today. Right there. 
you know, there's other companies that make microprocessors. But if you use a desktop computer, or not, not a cell phone computer or a tablet, if you use a desktop computer, you're either using an Intel microprocessor, which is an i3 or i5 or i7, the current generation, or you're using an AMD processor, which is a company that copies Intel out there. But the first microprocessor that they sold commercially in large quantities was the 8080, and that was an 8-bit microprocessor. Then there came the 8085, which was still an 8-bit microprocessor. It was actually an 8080 that they added a serial port and some other things to it. And then the next one they came out with was the 8086, which is a 16-bit processor. And then the 186, 286, 386, 486, and then they started calling them Pentiums, and then they started calling them i5s and i3s. But these are all generations of the same processor that came out in the 1970s, but they just keep making larger and larger. The data bus on a microprocessor is how much data that it can operate with at one time. And that's the bit size, the bus size of that there, the data bus. So when we talk about a microprocessor being an 8-bit microprocessor, it means that the data bus is 8 bits wide. If it's a 4-bit microprocessor, it's only 4 bits wide. There are still some 4-bit microprocessors out there, not very many. And they're usually used for microcontroller type applications, you know, for very specific tasks that they're. But most microprocessors today are either 16 or 32 bit. That they're, they're, and of course, desktops are, off, are mostly 64 bits right there, right now. But they're, well, those are all numbers that are dividable into groups of four. You know, up there. As you can well guess, writing binary numbers in ones and zeros is tedious. So to make our life easier, we group them in groups of four. Up there. In a prior lifetime, I was, I was when I was in the Air Force. We, I used to copy Morse code and encode messages. We use letters in groups of five. That the, the entire message was one long string, but it was broken up into groups of five of encrypted data that would then go through some type of decryption algorithm to find out what the message said. That there. Well, binary numbers we group in fours. Now, if we had the first microprocessor was a five bit and then a ten bit, we would be in groups of five. But since they decided to use a 4-bit, then an 8-bit, and then a 16-bit. We use groups of 4. There's nothing magical about 4 other than it works out great for microprocessors. So when we do that, we have a group of right there, and 4 bits goes 2 to the 8 right there. Excuse me, 4 to the 2 to the 4 right there means that we've got. 16 combinations right there. We're, you know, we now have the gorilla with eight toes and eight, eight toes on each foot, or in eight fingers on each foot. Now we ha now have a new numbering system that there, where we now have instead of or, that there are 16 toes right there. We now go to or eight, well, eight toes on each hand, so we now count zero to to 16 right there, right there. So we replaced 11 or 10 through 15 with letters, A through, right there. And that is a typical numbering system. Now this table right here is one that you should probably put to memory or at least be able to redo it at any point. It's a very easy table to do, and I'll show you how to do it very quickly. That there, <coughs> most people, would, when you convert from base 2 to base 16, do it by inspection. We don't do any math. We just use this table. You can do math if you want, but it's tedious. We usually just do it by inspection right there. So in, in order to do it by inspection, right there, we will first generate this table right there. And this table right here starts off here, and let me just do one column at a time. 0, 1, 0, 1, 0, 1, 0, 1, 1, 2, 1, 2, 3, 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 0, 1, 0, 1, 0, 1. 
right there. We just do it 010101. The next one we do 0011. 0, 0, 1, 1, 0, 0, 1, 1, 0, 0, 1, 1. Then we repeat that with 4. That's it. 0, 0, 0, 0, 1, 1, 1, 1, 0, 0, 0, 0, 1, 1, 1, 1. Then the last one is 8. Zero 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 one 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 right there. And hopefully I got them lined up right. I need one more here, huh? I'm just going to one right here. <laughs> right there. That's why I put the lines there. I, I, I always miss one there. So, so but, but, there, but there we have it lined up right there. So, so that's there. And this is 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, A, B, C, D, E, F, right there. So, so, so that's, that's, our, that's our number. So if you want to take a number, and I'm just going to write a random number down here, 0, 1, 1, 0, 1, 1, 0, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 0, 0, 0. I'm going to put my little breaks here. This first one's going to be a 6. The next one's going to be 1, 1, 0, 1. It's going to be D, F, and eight right there. So that that's the way you would convert that back right there. So again, all I did was just look at the table. Actually, I only looked at the table for the D because the other ones I know off the top of my head right there. So it's a fairly straightforward process. So we're going to be using base 16 for all of our all, all of our working that there when we deal with binary numbers. So it's Typically, the way that will work that there. <coughs> so going back to right there, this is our, our that there again. What the only thing I don't like about this slide right here is that if you look at this right here, you probably should show this in groups of four. Right there, and it's kind of hard to. But if you break it in a group of four, you can see where that eight, nine, six comes from right there. So that's really, there, it's the most convenient way. There was a company for a while that was using groups of three for some reason. They had a 27-bit word that they were operating with, so they broke it up into groups of three. That's their deck. That company's been long bankrupt, so I don't think anybody uses groups of three anymore. Well, I mean, you know, they had a they had a 27-bit microprocessor is what they were using on, on a mini computer. But they, were, they were actually around a long time. I mean, DEC, it was DEC, or Digital Equipment Corporation, and they made the faxes. They were quite popular for a number of years. But they, you know, they've been bankrupt probably for 15 years now. But they're, they're, so again, this slide here does the same thing. It's convert from hex to binary. It's just simply a matter of looking at the table. So all you have to do is just look at the table. That's there. We take all the math out of it. That's there. And again, the key thing here is that you just generate this table. If you were to see a final exam question where I ask you to convert a bunch of numbers from hex to binary and binary to hex, I would recommend that you write this table down. Don't try to do it from memory. Just write the table down. Out there, it's a fairly easy table to write. Come on, out there. It's got that nice neat little pattern right there. Right there. So, convert to out there. And typically, and this slide here is messed up here, but basically, if you want to convert from uh, hexadecimal to binary, 
you know, convert the binary first, then convert the hex. That there, if you want to convert a base 10 number to, to hexadecimal, it's probably easier to convert it to binary than to hex. Right there. If you happen to have a calculator, you just put the number in and it reads back out hex and binary. Or at least mine does, right there. So, I don't want to spend a lot of time talking about this process right there. Again, when you add numbers together, you have to remember that in this particular case, as we're going to be doing things in base 16, that when we carry, we carry 16. When we borrow, we borrow 16 right there. So you have to keep that in mind in this particular case here, and I'm just going to write this down here. I'm going to add 23D9 to 94BE right here. 9 plus E is what? That's 9 plus 14, right? So that's going to be 23. Now, when I, so now I'm going to have to carry out. So when I carry out using base 16, I carry a 16 out. So I've, so I've got 23, I subtract the 16, I'm left with a 7. So it's going to be a 7 right here, and then I carry a 1. So D plus 1 is going to be E, or 14, plus B, B is 11, right? So I get 25, right there. 25, I subtract off the 16, I'm left with 9. So I put a 9 here. And again, I carry 16 here. So 1 plus 3 plus 4 is 8. That's a valid right there, so I can write an 8 down. And 2 plus 9 is 11, which is a valid digit. I would write a B there, right there. So, that, so that's the key thing that when you look at adding binary numbers or hexadecimal numbers is that you carry 16. Same thing when you borrow right there. If I want to borrow two numbers together from right here, and this is probably not a good one, hopefully the next slide there. Yep, same thing here. If we're going to borrow here 59F, and we're going to subtract from it 2 B8 right there. 15 minus 8 is going to be 7. So that's valid, right? I cannot subtract 11 from 9, can I? I can't do that. So I have to add 16 to the 9. So that gives me 24, right? And then I subtract 11, that leaves me with 13. Or excuse me, 14. So I've got 9 plus 16, that's 25, right? But there, I subtract 11 from it, that leaves me with 14. 14 is a valid number, it's the letter E, so I write an E there. But then I borrowed one from here, so that's a 4. So that's 2, right there. So when you borrow, you have to remember you're borrowing 16, right there. So and this shows it fairly well right here. I have a 9, I have to, I borrow 16 from it, so I've got 25, I subtract 11 from it, and it leaves me with 14. So that's a valid subtraction right there. So because I borrowed a, a 1 from that there, I subtracted this 1. This is the borrow right there, that 1. This 1 here is what I borrowed right there. The borrow right there. I borrowed a 1 from that there. And then I subtract the two. So this gives me the valid, the valid answer, base 16, right there. So, okay, that's everything I'm going to talk about as far as numbering systems. We're going to see those again. In addition to numbering systems, we also have coding systems. There's many, many coding systems out there. The most popular is called the ASCII, the ASCII code. I'm sure you've heard of the ASCII code. What the ASCII code is, is it's a representation of every letter that a computer printer can print out in a numeric form, right there. So when we look at this here, and I can do a, ASCII table, 
right there. And I can go through here and here is the ASCII, here is the ASCII code right there. You see it goes from 0 to 127 right here. And then you've got the extended ASCII, which this one is not the extended ASCII. There's actually one that goes to 255. But as you go through here, you can see that it's, give, it's shown in, in decimal, hex, octo, right there. Some will show it in binary. Again, octo, nobody uses anymore, so right there. The ASCII code, by the way, the original ASCII code was an octo code. It only went to 127, right there. So as we look at, for example, the number one is actually right here. Here's the number one. It's actually hex 31 or decimal 49 right there. Now, the one good thing about the ASCII code is that they kept all the upper, they kept all the letters in order and they kept all the numbers in order. So you can do sorting by ASCII. You know, so if you write a computer, computer program to sort a list of names and you're using the ASCII, you know, you, you know they're stored in, a, in an ASCII format that it sorts properly. But for example, if you look at the ASCII code for, you know, my last name hack, it's 72, 65, 67, and 75. Now, when a file is stored in ASCII format, right, right there. So if I take this right here and I want to store this in, if, I, if this is stored in a program such as C, if I'm dealing with C for example, right there, and have you taken this microprocessor or uh, microcomputer programming course? Is that, is that, that, or are you taking that? You haven't had C yet? Okay. All right, well, the way that C deals with strings, this is called a string when you deal with computer programming, is that this is dealt in C as an array of ch characters. A, char a char in C is an 8-bit number right there. And I would define, a, an, say, something like last name as 20 like this, it's, it's what it's saying is char right there. I would define, this is the way I would might define it in C, for example. Now don't quote me on my syntax. I meant, I, I work with four or five different programming languages and I could screw up syntax quicker than anybody. So when you look at my C syntax, it might not be right. Because I also work with VHDL and Verilog and other languages. But it's something like that right there. This is, the, this is the data type, char 8-bit data. This is my variable name, and this is the size of the array. So what this is saying is that I've got an array of 20 characters that's going to be defined as last name. The first, which is the H. The H going back to... Right there. H is 72. Now let's, let's use the hex there. It's going to be 48. So the H is 0x48 right there. The A is a lowercase. The lowercase A is 61. Right there. The C is going to be and I'm going to just put 0x763 because I know that the B is 61, so C is right there. And the H right there, the, or the K, is going to be 6B. 6B. And then it's going to stick at the end here a 0, 0, which is the null character to say end of strength. So that's the way. That's the way letters are stored 
record in computers. It's using the ASCII code. I cannot do math on the letters. And what's happening here? So, and what is... In my... Something that's happening in my recording is not recording anymore. No, it's still recording. I don't know. I'm getting static in my earphones, so that's why I'm... All right, let me go back to my PowerPoint here. And let me ignore the... Right. Okay, so when we look at our ASCII code, that's just simply the way things are stored, right? Are stored. And a code is different. There are other types of codes. We'll talk later on about something called the gray code. And then there's other types of codes that we'll use. Codes are not numbering systems. That's the main thing that when we look at a code, it is not a numbering system. You can convert codes to numbers and do mathematics with them. But a code is not a numbering system. Don't expect to add, for example, and I'll just do it right here. Don't expect to add, and I'm going to put a quote, 1 plus 2 equals 3. The quote means, that single quote means that it's stored in ASCII code. That's not going to be the case right there. That is not going to be the case. You cannot add the number 3 in ASCII form to the number 2 in ASCII form and end up with 3 in ASCII. You can do that in binary. You can do it in hex. You can do it in decimal, but you can't do it in ASCII. Right there. Right there. You can subtract off, you know, I can subtract off 1 minus 0 right there, for example, and that converts it back to a number right there. But you cannot do mathematics up there. So the ASCII uses 7 bits in order to represent that table right there. All right. Now let's move on to digital right there. Our digital logic signals are going between 0 and 0.7 volts, 0 and 0.7 or 0.6, and they go from either 2.7 to 5 or about 1.8 to 3.3, depending on what value you have. This is the logic 1. This is the logic 0 right there. So everything in between is to allow for noise on the line right there. So we have two distinct values there, 0 between 0, and this is standard 5-volt logic right there. So, and I don't, right there. Now let's get into our gates right here. Right here, our basic gates are, and we've got about four of those. One is the AND gate. An AND gate simply means that the output is true. We represent the true by a 1 here. This is our, this is F, this is our function right there. Right there, that's our function of our gate right there. These are our two inputs, A and B. These are our inputs right there. And this is our typical truth table. We'll be seeing these truth tables quite a bit right there. And an AND gate, the output is true if A and B are both true. So in this particular case, we would normally write this in binary form, 0, 0, 0, 1, 1, 0, 1, 1. So this is binary 0, 1, 2, and 3 right there. We're going to use either hex or decimal. And the only place that it's true is this last line. The next gate is the OR gate. And it's true if A or B is going to be true right there. And in that particular case, the only time it's false 
is when A and B are both zero, right there. That's the only time that it, that it is false, right? There. So now we write the and as multiplication. We write the or as addition, right there. They are not the same, although we will find that when we start doing Boolean algebra that they will behave very much like addition and multiplication. But, but they are not addition and multiplication, right? Example right there. You know what we're going to see later on? A or with A is going to be equal to not 2A, but it's going to be equal to A right there. Mm -hmm. Right there, something like that. So you're going to find that there are some rules that we'll come up with that if we add A to A together, it's not two times A. Because A is either true or false. So if A is true, so A ORed with, o, with A is going to be one ORed with one, so that's going to be true. If A is zero, it's going to be zero ORed with zero, so it's going to be false. So the, the value of that is just simply A right there. Same thing with N. A times A, a times a is not a squared. It's going to be just simply a, right there. So, so it's not quite the same as addition and subtraction, but some of the same rules apply. This is the, this, this particular one is wrong, right there. This is a not gate, right there. A, a not gate simply means that the input is just inverted. Now later on, you'll see that we'll use this bubble right here. This little bubble simply means inversion or inverting. That's there. So, and I don't know how the audio of this recording is coming up because, like I said, my headphone is buzzing in my ear. It doesn't normally do that. All right, so this is the inverter. Then the, this one here is the XOR. The XOR is a kind of a strange one that it doesn't necessarily make sense in some ways, but what it is is that, is that it's true if A or B are true, but not both. Right there. So it's the same here. This is a one, this is a one, but if they're both true, then the output is zero right there. You see, now as it turns out, the XOR is a very powerful one for if we want to do adding. Because 1 plus 1 is equal to what? 0 with a carry out. But 1 plus 0 is 1. 0 plus 1 is 1. So if we want to do a very simple adder, we would use an XOR. A plus B, that's our sum. And then we use an AND gate for our carry out right there. And that's a little half adder right there. So we add A plus B right there. Now we want a full adder or we have a carry into it, then we have to get a little bit more complicated. But the XORs is very is a very handy gate for for adding. We want to do add addition right there. So we have something called the NAND gate and the NOR gate. And all it is is a AND gate with a bubble at the end. So that simply means that this column is the reverse of the AND gate. Same thing here. It's got the little right there. It's just simply the reverse of the NOR gate. Now, later on, we're, we're going to find that these NAND gates and these NOR gates are extremely, extremely important. And the reason is, is that as we go through and study this, the NAND gate will find, will represent, we could do any circuit that we ever want to do with combinational logic or even sequential logic and use nothing but NAND gate. It's the only gate we need. We don't need anything else. That's there. And we'll get to that point where, where that's true. But there, we'll find that, that they actually make chips, they call them gate arrays, that are just simply a SIA chip, SIA gate. Two million NAND gates placed on a single piece of silicon. And we just hook them up to however we want right there. So, 
These are some basic circuits right here. This is one that I just gave you a minute ago. This is the half adder. Right there. Right there. This is the same circuit, only this time we're not using the XOR. So we, re we replace, see this XOR replaces all three chips here. Right there. This is our full adder where we have right there. And then we can divide, this is called hierarchical design. We can sit there and we can design a full four bit adder doing this right here where we have four full adders. We have four inputs. And we'll do this as a lab assignment right there. One of the early ones. We have four outputs plus a carry out there. So we simply draw these, this circuit one time and then we can simply then add those together right there. So there. Okay, decoders. We'll be seeing these in a little bit more detail. This is down the down the road. But there a decoder is simply an AND gate with inverters on various inputs. These are used to look for a particular certain address typically on a line and select a particular chip right there. Output. So this is looking for the combination one zero zero one. This is looking for the combination zero one zero one right there. Right there. And if it's one zero one zero zero one zero one, this is going to be a one here. Any other input's going to give you a zero. Same thing here. It's looking for one zero zero one. Any other input's going to give you a zero. So we're decoding a particular address right there. It's a form of that there. We'll get that there. And I think I'm going to kind of wrap up here. I'm going to skip the flip flops because flip flops are much later up there. Let's jump into a little bit of some terminology here. We already defined a bit right there. A bit is a one or a zero. A nibble, which is the next largest size, is four bits. Then a byte is eight bits right there. And then why they didn't call this a gulp, I don't know. Because you got a little bit, then you've got a nibble, then you got a bite, and then we go to a word. Mm -hmm. So, because I don't know what they would call a double word or a quad word then. Maybe a quad word would be considered a buffet mm -hmm. right there. But these are the terms that we're looking for. You'll hear these terms here. A kilobyte is roughly a thousand bytes. One of the misleading things is that it's not exact. Gigabyte is 2 to the 30th. It's not the same as 1 billion. Same thing with terabyte. So you run into some issues there at times, right there. So, but these are some terminology. I'm sure you've seen these before, right? Everyone's bought thumb drives, right? Mm -hmm. Right there. You know, kilobytes, you probably haven't seen kilobytes in a long time. You know, my first desktop computer that I bought, you no, know, well, actually the first computer I bought had 4K of memory in it. You know, not 4 gigabytes, not 4 megabytes, 4K. And it plugged into a television set. And it used little cassette tapes for, for, for writing programs. Right there. Right there. You know, then my first real computer I bought was an IBM PC. It came with 64 kilobytes right there. So as, as time has gone on there, most people, when they talk about desktop computers, they talk about memory size in gigabytes, right? You buy a laptop, you know, the standard laptop has like two or four gig, right? That's the standard size of a laptop That's there. You know, if you look at desktop computers, you're talking anywhere between 8 and 32 gig right now, right there. And I've actually seen some 64 gig computers right there. So terabytes is what we're talking about in terms of hard drives right there. So these things have gone considerably larger and cheaper in price. I'm an old man. I admit to it, my gray hair and the lack of hair on my top of my head, along with my expanding waistline, 
says that I've been around for well over 50 years. Up there. And I remember buying a gigabyte hard drive. I was working for a company called Magnavox at the time. We made devices for the Navy. And we had to buy a gigabyte hard drive for a project. And this was in the early 1980s. Now, at that, you know, we talk about a gigabyte hard drive now, people are talking about why so small, right? Why so small a lot? It's probably the, the right term. That particular hard drive was the size of a standard Malaysian dishwasher or washing machine. I mean, this thing was probably about three feet tall by about two and a half feet square. Yeah, that's there. You were talking a relatively small washing machine size. And it had a cost at the time of 30,000 US dollars. Which, if you convert that to RM, it, we, we'll use the exchange rate of roughly three, you're a little over three, you're talking roughly 100,000 RM at the time. Because the exchange rate at that time was about 2.5, so it was probably closer to about 75,000. Between 75,000 to 100 RM. That's there. So, obviously, this thing that I, I have stopped the program, this is 32 or 32 gigabytes for a thumb drive right there. So as you can well guess, these things have gotten a lot cheaper right there. The first hard drive I bought for a computer was a 10 megabyte right there. So, and I thought I would never fill that. You, I couldn't ever fill that 10 megabyte hard drive right there. How can, how, how, how can you do that right there? So, Okay, I'm going to stop here because the rest of these slides get more into computer systems right there and away from where we're going. And I'm more concerned about the fact that I'm hoping that this 